Not even his enemies can deny his vibrant personality, his intelligence, and his dedication to the Republic. Chambay's stand for the political freedoms cherished by the Western world have gained him the savage hatred of the communists, but it is clear that he has won the hearts of his own people. While most of the missionary schools are Protestant and Shambay himself a Methodist, the Catholics are given equal opportunity for the practice and dissemination of their faith. Here is President Shambay in company with the Catholic Bishop in Elizabethville. The same freedom is enjoyed by the Jewish community in the city, the existence of which may surprise you as it did me on the occasion of my visit recently. I was invited to attend a bar mitzvah ceremony by Rabbi Silverbaum the spiritual leader of the Jewish community. At this confirmation service, President Chambay was an honored guest. These people are Katangi citizens, Jews who found religious freedom in this part of Africa. The family was as delighted as any American family would be if our own president should drop in to extend his congratulations on such an occasion. Leopoldville, the political crisis becomes acute. Blocked in its efforts to communize the Congo and overturn independent Katanga, the communist elements in the central government seek desperately for a device which will reverse the ebbing tide of red fortunes. In the face of food riots and widespread disorder, Lumumba's militia resorts to the classic technique of restoring order. In a shrewd play for world opinion, Lumumba turns to the United Nations in an appeal for United Nations forces to keep his regime from toppling, confident that the Soviet bloc therein will not be deaf to his plea. Here, Lumumba and his advisors prepare to leave for UN headquarters in New York in what he terms a goodwill visit to the United States. This trip was hailed in the world Soviet press as a supreme peace mission. Here is Lumumba arriving in Idlewild, where he receives the same warm welcome from the US State Department that was accorded such communists as Khrushchev and Castro before him. A grateful Lumumba makes immediate use of our free press and radio to muster support for his cause. His remarks were enthusiastically received. Later, Lumumba was whisked off to Washington where he was wined and dined and where he stayed in the president's official guest house. Parenthetically, Shambay was thrice denied a visa by the U.S. State Department and was unable to present the Katanga story in the United States. In the U.N., Lumumba, addressing the General Assembly, puts the blame for Congo massacres and riots on the re-entry of Belgian troops and demands United Nations intervention to forcibly and finally evict them from the Congo. He attacks the Republic of Katanga as the principal obstacle to Congo unity and demands its capitulation to the rule of the central government. Joining in the applause, ironically, are representatives of some of the smaller nations who had only recently achieved their own independence. The UN, under strong pressure from the Soviet bloc and so-called weather vane neutrals, led by Pandit Nehru of India, throw their full support to Lumumba. In this, they are joined by the United States. Mixed contingents of UN troops are dispatched to the Congo to force the Belgians out. 
leaving the white population and any further opposition once again at the mercy of Lumumba's hordes. While Belgian troops once again leave the Congo, the UN lands troops of mixed nationalities, such as Swedes, Indians, and Ethiopians, who are almost totally ignorant of the actual situation. Transported by Russian ships, a heavily armed contingent of UN combat troops disembarks at a Congo coastal town. Secretary General of the UN, Dag Hammarskjöld, arrives in Leopoldville to personally supervise the UN occupation of the Congo. He is greeted by President Kasavubu. The UN troops enforcing Lumumba's dictates commit serious breaches of international conduct. Here, in violation of his diplomatic immunity, UN troops force the Belgian ambassador Jean van den Bosch at gunpoint out of his embassy and expel him from the Congo. With the Belgians forcibly evicted, the central Congolese government, supported and advised by UN forces, starts an arms race toward the buildup of a central Congolese military striking power. Security is tightened in a move to suppress the growing masses of discontented Congolese, whose concept of independence was not that of a military dictatorship. While UN and central government forces combine their strengths, which include all the destructive machinery of modern warfare, the world press cheers the peace efforts of the United Nations in the Congo. Taking advantage of the situation, Congolese government is quick to propagandize through the UN that with Belgians removed from the Congo, the only obstacle to a successful unification is now independent Katanga, which, paradoxically enough, through all the chaos and military buildup around it, has maintained the most peaceful and stable economy in the Congo. While the UN tightens Congo security and flexes its muscles in a parade of strength, raped and persecuted nuns, missionaries, and civilians continue to flee the central Congo. All this while central Congolese President Kasabubu is busy catering to influential guests such as Soviet Minister Valerian Zorin. Here, Kasavubu welcomes Dr. Ralph Bunch, who represents the wealthy and generous United States. Dag Hammarskjöld, Secretary of the United Nations, calls on Kasavubu for a top-level conversation. Subject, how to crush Katanga's independence and force it to accept the rule of the central government. What came out of these talks was the old reliable Trojan horse plan. The United Nations unconditionally pledged to Chambay that if he permitted United Nations forces to enter temporarily, it would pledge absolutely no interference in Katanga's internal affairs. Thus assured, Chambay, in a show of good faith toward the World Organization, permitted the entry. Since America is a part of the United Nations, we are called on to do our share and respond dutifully. These UN troops, who will shortly occupy Katanga, were transported by United States Globemasters. In a gesture that was a curious compound of goodwill and some inner doubts, Chambé and his aides pay an unheralded visit to the United Nations headquarters in Elizabethville to welcome the troops. The atmosphere is friendly on both sides and there is little to hint that the United Nations forces are anything but temporary visitors. Here Chambé, with the aid of an interpreter, is chatting with some of the Irish officers in command. If the number of troops and their military equipment have given him any premonition of what was to come, he still obviously relied at this point on the assurances given to himself and his people. His presence quite naturally attracts the curiosity of many onlookers, and when he leaves, a crowd of well-wishers, 
both Europeans and natives wave a friendly farewell. <laughs>